All right. Welcome, everybody, um, to the Ad Hoc Commission on the Discipline System Progressive Working Group, Progressive Discipline Working Group. I will now call the roll. Um, Ray Bonaventura. Present. Sarah Good. Here. Jenna Jones. I do not see. Shalon Joseph. I do not see. Um, Steve Moab. I, I'm, I'm here. Justin Shalon is in the attendees. Oh, OK. Let me make more people co-hosts. So. Okay. Good morning, Shalom. Good morning. Thank you, Stephen, for seeing me. <laughs> okay. Um, Eloise was having internet issues, so I don't think she will be here. Judge Wang? Good morning, present. And Martin Winfield, I do not see either, but we do have a quorum. At this time, um, I would like to call for public comment. If there's anyone from the public that would like to make a comment, please raise their hand. I don't see anybody at this time. So we will move on. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I will start to share my screen. Can people see my screen? I, oh. Okay. <laughs> Everything froze for a moment. It was... It's all good. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. This is the Progressive Discipline Working Group. Our agenda today is um, to review um, the Progressive Discipline as it was discussed previously in the Effectiveness Subcommittee and also the Fairness Subcommittee. I would like to identify the scope of what this working group, you know, officially finalize the scope on what this working group would like to solve and what it would like to work on. And then also given that um, research question, what data or other information should be gathered and presented to the working group so that the working group can accomplish this task. So it's an entrance meeting to try and understand what we need to do and what we need to gather in order to do that task. Um, as a brief history of this, the effectiveness subcommittee discussed the progressive discipline in reference to case processing. Um, I don't need to speak for Judge Wang because she is on the um, working group here, but we talked about how this impacts, um, you know, the, the settlement and also just case processing in general. And we talked about it in terms of discretion, that there are discipline standards and there, there are certain things that, and case law that um, Judge Wang, you have to um, adhere to. So I don't know if you wanna mention anything more about that. No, okay. <laughs> then um, it was also discussed in the fairness subcommittee. It was actually a topic of discussion in fairness. And we had um, Joe Carlucci from the office of chief trial counsel make a presentation on progressive discipline. And he told us the history of the progressive discipline, talked about the standards, talked about the ABA standards, and talked about the case law um, with progressive discipline. And also, we sent out a survey to other states and had some responses from other states on how they um, deal with the issue of progressive discipline. Um, so I would just like to go over the standards really quickly before we talk about the scope of the committee. And so, um, standard 1.8, um, it was adopted, it was revised from 1.7 in 2014. And so this standard has been in effect um, since then. And the attorney standards, uh, the standards for attorney sanctions and professional misconduct um, are trying to standardize um, the discipline process. So it's evenly um, enacted when it's used. 
These standards, when they were adopted in 2014, the Board of Trustees had a Discipline Standards Task Force created to review these standards, and they reviewed all the discipline standards, not just 1.8. And that task force did not make any recommendations to 1.8. Um, the revision earlier in the year was just adopted as is. Um, 1.8, I don't need to read it, but it talks about a single record of prior discipline. Um, it should be greater than that. Um, it 1.8 continues on um, to talk about where disarmament is appropriate, and then also talks about uh, actual suspension and how that relates to the prior disciplinary matters. Um, and everyone can read. I don't need to read it for you. And this is just a brief refresher. Um, and then say, it talks about all levels of discipline, so sanctions can be imposed. Um, for the prior rec, uh, record of discipline. So that's the discipline standards. Um, the ABA also has disciplinary recommendations and those recommendations um, are on progressive discipline that many of the other states reference those as um, recommendations that they use and why they use progressive discipline is because of the ABA standards. So, Right now, I would like to have a kind of a discussion with the working group. What is the issue that you would like to see solved by this working group? Um, is it a review of the disciplinary standard 1.8? Are there things that you would like presented to you on the disciplinary standards? Um, I just kind of want to open up the discussion as to what each working group member thinks the scope of this working group should be. And I see Ray has his hand raised. Yes. Uh Thank you, uh, Justin. I'm sorry, I wasn't, I'm not able to put my camera on. I'm having uh, internet issues. But um, so uh, I see a couple of things. Um, I'd like to see the language must uh, be um, removed and replaced with may. Um, I would also, according to 1.8, the really there are only two criteria of whether or not progressive discipline is going to impose the remoteness and the seriousness of the prior, if you will, prior conviction. And, and I come from it from a criminal uh, law background. And essentially what we have in criminal law, um, for example, uh, is the three strikes law. And so under the three strikes law, the prior conviction um, can be stricken, if you will, under a case of People versus Romero. And in order for a judge to strike that prior conviction, the judge has to state reasons on the record as to why. They do include remoteness and the seriousness of the prior. But in addition to that, they include other factors which I think should be considered. Um, uh, so in a typical criminal three strike case, it's um, things like, what has that person done to rehabilitate, rehabilitate uh, themselves? What kind of uh, substance abuse issues do they might have? What kind of mental health disorders they may be suffering from? Um, what kind of community involvement uh, they may, may have had? How have they progressed in their employment in advancement in their career? What, what, have, what impact have they done in the community? Uh, so, there are various factors, I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I think that 1.8 just limits the, it to remoteness and um, the seriousness of the prior, which I don't think is enough. I think there should be more factors contributing to that uh, um, analysis. Uh, and then again, I think there should be some latitude by, by removing the word must and it should be may. Thank you. Okay, so I'm definitely hearing that you want to review the standard 1.8 for potential language changes. Um, does anybody else have thoughts on that? Anything they would like? Judge Wang. Well, I, I was expecting Steve to uh, jump in at this point, but I think Melanie, um, this is, uh, and Ray, I was a public defender, so I just want to give you the context that I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think I raised this at some point, and I think Melanie 
raised it. Um, the question when we're looking at it from a committee perspective is, are there differences in criminal law and regulatory law where we don't want to give this discretion? Because when we're looking at, um, I think Melanie raised this, when you um, add discretion, that's where you can create more disparity. And I think that was the whole point of the standards to create uniformity so that there was less unfairness in some ways. So I don't know how to craft. I, I am bothered by 1.8 just because I do find it to be inflexible, <laughs> inflexible based on what Ray had identified. It, it's a very rigid um, criteria. And if you look at case law, it's very wonky. It's all over the place. And when you look at the case law as a whole, you can see why it's so wonky because um, it doesn't create enough discretion. So you have all these outliers, but if you look at it, there is no solid test in terms of when you can go outside of 1.8 and when you can't. And when you look at case law that it's so wonky, that means that the rule doesn't create the flexibility that um, the um, players believe is needed. So I, I, I know I'm just kind of rambling and not really giving that guidance, but that is a concern. How, how much flexibility do we give and who has that discretion? Um, so when you're looking, I don't want to bring in Gascon in LA right now, but one of the big issues is the application of 1385 and whether or not um, it's being exercised properly. So is this going to be uh, this must versus may? Is this now a charging decision by OCTC? Is this now a court decision where you can strike it under Romero or Maori? Um, so those are kind of con concerns that I wanted to kind of address. I know this is going to be um, possibly a dark hole we're, <laughs> we're entering, but um, and I, I'll invite Steve to um, add to that if he wants. Thank you, Judge. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I certainly, I don't have a problem with, no, and I don't know why I would, with the commission, with the working group looking at the text of 1.8. Uh, I, I mean, I do think there's a potentially a downside to including all of the sort of criminal sentencing factors in this analysis. Some of the things, you know, for the reasons Je Judge Wang mentioned, uh, I think that there also is a long history here of having progressive discipline before the standards uh, and then the standards just sort of codified that um, and the Supreme Court, you know, from the Hamilton case in 79 uh, on forward uh, and has repeatedly stated over and over that uh, progressive discipline is appropriate and and in fact it's looking at, you know, the failure to reform one's behavior demonstrates that greater discipline is appropriate in order to deter future misconduct, which is really the purpose uh, of the attorney discipline system. And so it's important to, to look at that. And, you know, the, the Supreme Court gives the standards great weight, even though they have plenary power to over discipline. Uh, but that is presumably because the standards are, at least at this point, consistent with their view of how the attorney discipline system should operate. Um, and I think that that adding some of those other things, uh, number one, it, they're already a little bit accounted for, um, although not explicitly necessarily. And number two, uh, it may introduce some of the problems that Judge Wang mentioned. Uh, I do think that when you look at 1.8 and I, I'm not saying it's the perfect thing. I agree with Judge Wang that there's a little bit of uh, 
you know, confusion. But when you look at the the previous misconduct and saying, okay, there's sort of an out there as far as, okay, it's not so serious that we need to impose greater discipline or, because it would be manifestly unjust, right? I mean, that's sort of the interests of justice type of thing that I'm hearkening back to my criminal law days uh, that where there's sort of an out there. Um, but again, I have no problem with uh, the working group looking at the language of 1.8. Uh, Sarah, you have your hand. Um, I wanted to also talk about something that kind of moves in a little bit of a different direction. Are we also considering what to do with so-called, you know, exculpated uh, state bar offenses and how those are calibrated into the progressive discipline system. Um, so it was more really a question um, at this point. I was wondering if that was something that we were looking at. It really, I think, needs to be examined closely with the folks, and I think I'm on that subcommittee, uh, looking at exculpation. Uh, but wanted to have a discussion about it. I, sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand. Are you, Sarah, are you talking about the like expungement and whether the, if the case was expunged from, you know, not show, doesn't show up on the website versus whether it could not be used as a as a prior for you know circumstance and aggravation sort of thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, expungement really was the word I'm looking for. It's early here, but um, <laughs> and not just about the website, but expunged, you know, expunged substantively, which we haven't taken up yet, Correct. and how that comes into play. Because if we are, then I think that. Uh, sort of militates in favor of more discretion to the state bar court judges. Um, you know, I, I could see that the question of having discretion would factor into uh, that particular question. Um, so. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on Rule 1.8 and looking at it. Okay. So I, I have I have one comment, uh, if I may. Sure. sure. So um, I, I think we need to um, remember that we are we are here because we all believe that the system was is broke when it comes to the discipline of black and brown people. And so if we accept that uh, notion that they have been unfairly treated in the past, why are we not willing or why are we, um, uh, I, I guess my issue is if, if their conviction or their, for lack of a better term, their, their, this, their wrongdoing, the, the we can say that they were unfairly treated in the past. Why would we use that conviction, if you will, against them in the future, knowing that perhaps they were already treated unfairly in the first place? So that's why I think we need to move and push this um, in a way that does have an effect on the prior discipline that they received, recognizing it may have been flawed in the first place. And so that's why I, I, I'm really in favor of having a lot of discretion when it comes to taking that into consideration. Thank you. Um, Jenna, you have your hand up. Good morning. Um, I'm in support of the May, uh, changing the word to May. Um, as Ray said, and um, Dr. Wang or um, Judge Wang said, I think May is is a good way to go with this. But I'm a, just a public member, so. But I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so I think in terms of scope, it, it's looking at <laughs> the dark hole that we may be going down, but the 1.8 standard, and if there, you know, specifically may has been referenced, what, um, what information could we bring back to the working group that could help um, you know, justify the, the changes or help inform what changes need to be made to the standards? Are there any research tasks that we can do? I mean, I've heard several different things that, um, talked about, you know, in case on the Hamilton case, I, I've, I've taken copious notes, the application of 1385. There are a lot of things that were mentioned in this, and I don't know if it's just a pre, a, a extensive presentation for those committee members that aren't into the weeds like Judge Wang and, and Steve are um, on the various case laws uh, or the, the history of the standards. I'm, I'm just trying to understand what we as staff can bring back to the working group so that you can make an informed decision and um, Shalon. Thank you, Justin. I'm not sure if this is going to make sense to the question that you just asked, but as I'm thinking of what the comments are, I um, and, and I was a public defender for 25 years, and now I'm in the district attorney's office, and I, I have seen the in-application of 1385 um, apply to me as a DA in cases now that I would have never, ever, ever heard judges um, use in my 25 years as a public defender. And so I don't know how you get to the root of this, but some of it is how judges interpret 1385 and how they're going to use it in different circumstances, right? So you, we could do all these, these changes to the statute and everything. And then ultimately it comes to how the judges who are hearing these cases, um, are applying it, right? Or using their discretion in the right way. So I don't know if we can if we can see the data of how the use, the judge's rulings um, in certain cases created these inequities to see how that may guide us in looking at the standards. Cause some of it I think has to be how it's applied right and not just necessarily the rule because we have all we have rules we have the penal code and it gets applied um differently depending on which court which bench officer you're in front of and so i don't know if you can distill it from if you can distill the data from the applic applicability of the court in in giving sentences or punishment. Okay, um, Judge Wang. I'll take a stab at this. But <laughs> uh, so 1385 is in the interest of justice and I agree with you, Shalon. I think if you look not just uh, county to county, if you look at one uh, jurisdiction within that jurisdiction, I agree with you. If you go courtroom A, you're gonna get a very different result from courtroom C, I agree with you. Um, if you're looking for data points in the state bar court, however, you're, I, I don't know if we can find that. So it's because the standard is so rigid and Steve can jump in here with Silverton. So we had a judge who uh, decide, decided not to apply it at the hearing level. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, look, we have the standard reads this way for a certain reason. Um, you have to hit both points, both prongs of 1.8B and reversed. And to be honest with you, after that, the hearing department was a little bit more gun shy about applying 1.8. And I think I made this uh, point to the whole committee at the very beginning. So when, you when you're looking at criminal cases in the Superior Court, there is a lot of push and pull, right? So there's a lot of litigation from all the divisions. When there's a split, the Supreme Court now weighs in and says, no, we want it this way. The state bar court decisions are, are a lot more rigid. We don't have different divisions 
and the Supreme Court, frankly, trusts us. They want us to get it right. They don't want to have to reweigh and in, in, get involved. And that's why this committee is really important, why that task force committee that uh, Justin talked about is so important, because there aren't going to be changes unless, you know, um, it's kind of brought to the attention of, you know, the board and, and the legislature. So um, that was a very uh, non-answer to your question, but <laughs> that's the best I can do. <laughs> no, that, that answers it, but it raises just more questions in the sense that if, if the standards are, are so rigid, then is it the filings? I mean, what is getting, what got us, I mean, I know the study's there, but but in practicality, what got us to this point that we need this task force and there's so such a disparate impact on black men in particular. Um, I mean, is it is it the is it I mean, I'm, I'm gathering from all the uh, committees that I'm sitting on that a lot of it is a lot of complaints that may be unfounded um, that, you know, then get thrown into the 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 equation of filing more serious charges that then get in front of the court. But I guess I'm trying to figure out what your answer made complete sense, but then I guess it raises other questions. It does. <laughs> and, um, you know, and what the filings are and how, and how it get, how do so many black men get to the point that they're looking at what they're facing standard one B as opposed to anybody else? How is that happening? Um, and then maybe that's, you know, can be factored into how, if we figure out how they're there, and I'm sorry, Justin, I don't know how you do that, but <laughs> then maybe we can look at why, you know, and trying to resolve it from that. Exactly. And, and part of it, and now that you were a PD and now a DA, you have charging discretion. So you can decide whether or not to charge the prior. A judge can decide it's so stale, I can strike the prior. There's no capability here. As, as far as I know, OCTC, if there's a prior, they allege it. And if it's a state bar court, we have to apply 1.8. And we've tried a lot of work around. So that's why I, I, in my view, the decisional law is very, it's tortured because you're, you know, bad facts create bad law. <laughs> and um, it, it, there is, there is, is an attempt to apply it uniformly, but that results in unfairness sometimes. And so it's, it's, a, it's a struggle and we don't have um, 1385 power on the current case either. If you, I, I'm, Justin, I'm sorry, open up another can of worms. So you have the 1.8, then you have 5.124, the dismissal um, rule. And I've, asked around, I don't know, and Steve probably um, will agree with me, I don't know of any application of, uh, of the court dismissing on its own motion under 5.124. So there is a small carve out under 5.124 G1 that I think is supposed to parallel 1385, um, I mean, uh, G2. The court may move on its own motion to dismiss to further justice, but must give the parties notice and state the reasons why. I don't know of any application of that, and I don't know if the genesis of that was to create more fairness at one point. Um, uh, this rule preceded me. It was, a f I think, was effective January 2011, but I don't know if that's something um, uh, in terms of recrafting 1.8 to parallel something like the 5.124 G2, if we're getting to that language. But um, again, in answering, trying to answer Shalon's question, I've created more questions, but um, there you have it. See, Justin, <laughs> I, didn't, I don't know if you needed me on this committee because I think I'm just creating more issues than... Um, well, th that was a tangible thing that I think we can research. <laughs> so I was actually really happy that you brought that up because okay, the okay, there we go. wasn't I, as I tangible, agree, but I, I think Lisa took that down that we could see if that was applied, um, has been applied and in what instances and bring that information back. 
Okay, good. I did contribute in some way. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. I think that that's a, that's a great observation. And, and it also sounds like a data problem that we can try to solve, that we can research and try to solve. I also think that Shalant's <clears throat> point about how uh, Black men got to the point where they are is also a great question. And we should follow that up and, and see, it, is it because of 1.8? Or is it because of something else uh, that is causing the the disbarments, et cetera? Because I, you know, at some level, you sort of you want to focus on what the where the problem is, and uh, I don't know whether this is where the problem is or not. Uh, it may be, uh, but I don't know that to be true. And so, uh, to Ray's point, I I get, you know, that we want to resolve issues raised by by the Farkas report, but let's, I, I think it's appropriate to focus on the where the problems are. Right, and just to add my two cents here, you know, part of where we've been focused on the disproportionate discipline is a, a separate track entirely where <clears throat> Professor Robertson, uh, and I think a presentation was given on the work that Professor Robertson is doing, but Professor Robertson was brought in following the Farkas report and um, uh, interviewed people in OCTC, examined processes, um, looked at the report itself, in particular looked at the um, some of the data points that were pointing, that, suggesting issues of um, representation as an issue. So um, African-American men tended to um, face charges without representation more often than others. So that was one of the data points that suggested an area that's been, uh, we're working on with uh, uh, Attorney Discipline Defense Council. Um, this issue of expungement, uh, we'll call it expungement, but the archiving of uh, priors. So where, prior, where complaints have come in that were uh, uh, closed uh, without uh, further, without any discipline imposed, those, uh, those complaints are now shield that uh, the attorneys in OCTC are unable to see those once they reach an age of five years or older. Um, so there have been a number of uh, policy changes that have grown out of the specific issues that were um, uncovered by Farkas in his report. Okay. Um... So I, I think we have the, the one data request and then also talking about Steve's, if we can look closer at the data from the Farkas report. Um, well, I mean, I'm not necessarily focused on the Farkas report, but it does seem like, like you know, the outcomes that, that are alarming to all of us we should look at and see how they got there. For example, is was 1.8 a factor in those uh, or or not? I don't know. Uh, right. And, and what percentage? And was it something else? Was it the the representation? Was it, uh, you know, whatever else? And see if we can really follow those. And I understand the Farkas report and the uh, regression analysis focused on certain things, but it may be of more value to go through and sort of look at them uh, closer to really see if we can focus on areas that will make appropriate changes. I, I think that that sounds like, I think that that's a sensible approach in particular because the Although there is the statistical, you know, the statistical issue showed that there, well, frankly, the statistical issue showed that there was not a racial effect once you controlled for uh, prior complaints, once you controlled for prior investigations, once you controlled for um, representation. Um, however, um, we're still looking at a pretty small number, and this is unfortunately, pardon my camera. Um, I mean, this is unfortunately, uh, due to the fact that there's a few African-American male attorneys to begin with in, in the state of California itself is hugely problematic. But because there are so many African-American male attorneys and then within that group, the number that is disciplined 
is relatively small, just as an absolute number. So it's something where one could look back at the cases and look to see if these uh, these issues of uh, priors and how they were handled um, was uh, material in the outcome of that case. I mean, I think we're talking about at most a couple dozen cases. Okay. Is there anything else? Um, we, we've talked about a lot. I have a lot of notes. Lisa and I will be getting together and going over all this stuff um, before we bring it back to the committee. But is there anything else that anyone on the working group um, thinks would be useful in this discussion? Okay. I don't see any hands raised. Um, I would, these working groups um, are of a size where it would be useful if uh, to have a chair. So I don't know if anybody, and don't all like turn off your cameras and run away at once, but if anybody on this working group would like to be a chair, I'm willing to take volunteers now. Uh, I'm publicly trying to get it, or you can email me later if that interests you. Um, but it is useful when working groups get of a certain size to have a chair. And I will solicit that in email as well. Um, it, it won't require that much um, effort. It would just be a quick check-in with me to go over agendas and things, so. Seeing none, I'll, I'll continue. Maybe we'll volunteer the people that couldn't make the meeting as one likes to do. Um, okay. Uh, I think I will give 20 minutes back to everybody. I really appreciate it. I, uh, I think we have our marching orders and we will um, send out, once we kind of get an understanding of how long this will take to you know, get the information and bring it back to you, then we'll set the next meeting date. Uh, I don't think I know that at this time. So with that being said, if there's nothing else, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Yeah.